Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are joining us from around the world. Welcome to Creation Conversations. I am Sam. I am going to be your temporary host for now because we have just lost Joe. Um, uh, it appears he's having some connection issues, but doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's all good. Uh, we're joined today by our international director, John Mackay. We're joined by Craig Hawkins, back down in Tassie. And we're also joined by Dr. Diane Eager. How is everyone today? Well, I guess I'm all right here in Australia, in Queensland, but the problem is it's the weather. Uh, all this global warming is making it so cold. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit troubled with the weather out here at the moment. How about you, Diane, down in Canberra? It's pretty chilly here as well. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it is, it's still winter here, but, uh, yes, we've been having a, a cold, dull, wet winter, yes. Craig, what about you, mate? Mm. You give us a global f forecast in Australia here because quite a few of my friends overseas are troubled by all the reports on how the heat is going mad. Yeah, well, we've had a pretty typical winter here, really, and uh, even last summer wasn't that uh, warm down here, so uh, not going too bad, yeah. And that, there's that. Joe, who's joined us Testing, live. testing. One of you testing. You're I don't know if you can good. hear. But yes. I can hear absolutely nobody, which is going well. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, I'll carry because on. the audio is being sent somewhere else, which it is. Testing, testing. Testing, we testing. Can hear you, there we Joe. go. Now it works. There we go. I don't know what happened there. All Let's rejig everyone so everyone's in the right places. <laughs> right. There we go. Yes, you put us all in our place, Sam. <laughs> there yeah. we go. That's better. <laughs> That's better. I'll go last. <laughs> anyway, anyway, good to see everybody. I see there's people already here. Thanks for holding the fort, Sam. Mm, it's all right. Is it just, uh, I don't know what happened there, but there we go. Anyway, where did we get up to? We were just seeing how people were doing. Oh, excellent. That's good. Hopefully we're all doing all right then. Well, I've um, got I've got the lurgy, so I'm not yes, feeling well, too okay. great. <laughs> I've, uh, I've had the lurgy. I'm mostly over it now, so it's definitely something going around, but there we are um anyway welcome to creation conversations it's great to see you all and everybody in the uh, in the room already and uh, apologies about the little hiccup that we had just a moment ago um we are dealing with a a rather special topic today we're continuing with our theme of uh, having dug through the archives of creation research in the uk and found a load of old recordings uh, from media um, appearances from John Mackay a few years back. We've had so far uh, clips of John on Sky News, which is a big uh, news channel in the UK. Uh, we've had clips of John on Fox News, which is a big news channel in the USA. And we've also, obviously, a couple of weeks back, had John Mackay versus Richard Dawkins um, never really televised, except for a tiny fraction of it, but we were able to get hold of the complete uh, unedited version. So that's ready to, uh, or that's already out, and that went out a few weeks ago, and that's been good so far. Today, we're doing something a little bit different. We are looking at a uh, media appearance which did go out um, a few years back, and John will explain a little bit more. But it was actually the only time that John Mackay has ever been on the BBC, uh, and we'll find out a little bit more about that story as we go on. But it was uh, in a sort of, uh, it was called uh, Hard Talk, BBC Hard Talk. It was uh, very well-known journalists and presenters basically get on people of interest uh, that are dealing with things that are of interest at that time and, and grill them to bits, uh, really take them to pieces. In fact, some of them have been heavily criticised in the past for how ferocious their interview has been. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but we're going to be watching for the first time Ever since it was put on the BBC, um, we're going to be watching the BBC Hard Talk appearance because we were actually given a copy of that after John had been on the BBC and it's only just been rediscovered in our archive. So we're very much looking forward to digging through that today. But before we uh, get to uh, just very briefly, John, I'm going to go over to you because you've been very busy as of late, particularly with one particular project. And you've even filmed uh, a few little bits, which we're going to watch first uh, a couple of minute long clip. But uh, over to you to explain what's been going on, John. OK, uh, welcome all around the globe there, whether it's warm, whether it's hot, whether you're up over or down under. And uh, you're going to join us in a moment with me and Dr. Diane Eager as we look at some evidence and how to think about the evidence. Because we often get challenged here in creation research. Uh, you're just a religious organization just dealing with beliefs. Now, one of the things we've concentrated on 
is uh, recordings, uh, filming, uh, doing the actual evidence for creation, not just the evidence against evolution. It was characteristic of many of the early creation groups that they spent time attacking evolution. Spot on, guys. Keep it up. It needs to be done because it's the worst theory we've ever had on the planet. It's a theory about what's supposed to happen, what's supposed to be happening, and what will happen based on nothing happening at all, at least in terms of evolution, things evolving, things coming out of one thing and going to another. And, of course, the Bible says not only did God create things after their own kind, but it's very emphatic in the New Testament that the evidence of creation, yes, past, is present. The evidence of creation is clearly seen, says Paul in Romans. Now, clearly seen has no other meaning than you can spot it, I can spot it, Richard Dawkins can spot it, David Attenborough can spot it, and therefore don't be surprised that the Bible says you are lying if you say it doesn't exist. So we've taken it as our challenge to sort of make this very visible, very, very viewable, very understandable to the ordinary person by forcing them, nicely of course, to ask the question, given that creation is true, what would the evidence be? Now, in science, of course, that you're dealing with, uh, given evolution is the only way to understand things, here's what the evidence is. Now, never do the students get a chance to ask, well, if life evolved from simple chemicals up to advanced molecules to cells to Joseph Hubbard sitting there in his studio in the museum in England, what would the evidence be? Uh, they don't think that way. They're not even trained to evaluate evidence. They're just brainwashed with the theory of evolution. So we've made it our business to unbrainwash them, to forcibly challenge them with questions. Now, I keep telling people, uh, haven't been involved in education, whether it be at primary or a secondary, or whether it be tertiary level, lecturing in geology, to actually learn how students think. Sadly, in our modern world, many of them don't know how to think. They know how to absorb the latest theories. And when, when we first began doing this, I actually was uh, in, a, in a very sophisticated education um, college, and I began by asking the students, how would you know what you know in the first place? And that turned into a course which came to the attention of the Minister of Education, which turned into a series of lectures, which we filmed in uh, Griffith University, much to the disgust of many of the authorities because they didn't like us talking positively. But they tolerated us mildly if we attacked the evolution, but the minute we went positive and said, the Bible says the evidence for creation is so clear. So in this first little clip, which is coming out of our newest museum, um, yes, rah, rah, our newest creation discovery centre, yay, 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 here in Queensland, Australia, and Craig was up here and Diane was up here a few weeks ago as we had our grand opening for Dinosaurs, the Monsters God Made. We've done a little bit of uh, shooting on what would the evidence be? Now, Diane and I are going to be seen in this first clip, which really deals with a very simple idea, much credit to Craig and the others who first thought of it, dealing with Lego blocks, because we've got a question on how would you end up with dinosaurs? How would you recognise the evidence of designosaurs? In fact, Joe, uh, I'll be at the museum a little later today. We've got a, a crowd there. We're going to film it. Uh, we've got some people who want to be trained to be museum caretakers because I can't be everywhere at one go. Neither can any of our staff. And so we're going to film some of this today. But for the introduction today, to give you a look at the background knowledge of what so aggravated Richard Dawkins, David Attenborough, the BBC, and many of the education groups, why are they so mad at something which is so obvious? And our little video clip here on Designosaurs really demonstrates that. Joe, perhaps if you want to uh, play that, and then we'll come back to me. Absolutely, yep. Let's just get it up and going now. Designosaurs, here we go. I'm here with Dr. Diane Eager again in our Creation Discovery Centre and we, we've got, well, what have we got here, Diane? Well, we have two model dinosaurs and we have a whole lot of plastic bits over there. And we actually have 
the Lego kit that we bought to make it out of, correct? That's right. But what's the whole point of this in a room full of dinosaurs, real and, and, and cast dinosaurs? What, what are we trying to achieve? It's to get people to understand what it takes to make a creation. Okay, so when you look at this unassembled Lego box, you look at the Triceratops, and you look at the actual T-Rex, uh, what do we ask the kids to do? Well, we ask them, how long would it take for those unassembled plastic pieces to form one of these, one of the Triceratops or the Tyrannosaurus? All by themselves. All by itself. And have we had any kids not get the answer so far? So far, they've all been really smart. They know very well that unassembled Lego blocks do not make themselves into dinosaurs. In fact, folks, you can learn a lot about evangelism from this because I had one little guy, four or five years of age, and we started talking about God and he said, I don't believe in God. And so I asked him, did he like making Lego? Oh, yes, mister. I said, do you like making those little Lego mans, the robots ones or thing? Oh, great stuff. I said, have you ever had the Lego blocks turn into a man by himself? No. I said, so you have to be smart to put it together. Yes. I said, well, and then he said, I believe in creation now. You see, anybody can see this. That's, that's what the Bible says. The whole of the creation reveals the handiwork of God, the creator. In fact, Dr. Eager, didn't I give you one of these unassembled sets and you have to take a fair while to turn it into a T-Rex or a Triceratops? Yes, I put the Triceratops, the T-Rex together. Okay, now, did it happen by itself or did you need your brains? No, I needed my brains and I also needed some instructions. I had to read through a whole lot of a little booklet with lots and lots of information in it. And somebody else with another brain must have put that there. So a lot of brains and a lot of information went into that Triceratops. So don't be surprised, even the Lego kit says Creator. Ah, uh, good on you Lego for telling the truth because evolution is absolutely impossible as a chance random process of any sort. Oh, things fall apart by chance, things just disintegrate randomly, but they don't make anything new at all. Remember, the evidence for creation is everywhere. Well, there we go. A, a great little evidence. And in fact, we've got exactly the same thing just over here to my uh, to my right. I can see we have a display which we'll be taking with us to a convention in the next few days, or next couple of weeks rather, um, in order to put that on display there as well. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same concept. In fact, I believe, Craig, your concept in the museum was the, uh, the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Is that right? Uh, Sydney Opera right. House. Sydney Opera House. It was one of the one of the two. But yeah, it's the um the same uh, the same same point is very very clear. In fact, one of the places we'll be taking that setup to. Uh, we mentioned this last week. The uh, Truth in Science uh, Summer School, which I'll be speaking at two sessions amongst uh, a whole number of other people. So do go to the Truth in Science website. That's happening in a couple of weeks' time at the end of August, and we'll be taking displays and setting stuff up there as well. So um, great stuff, John and uh, uh, keep uh, an eye out for more information about the museum project as we go forward. We're probably going to be doing, we were just discussing it beforehand, a uh, museum special creation conversations uh, and all about the kind of displays and things that we have in our museum in the next few weeks, which will be very good. All right, John, um, we were digging through the archives and we came up with this uh, recording, which will be... Um, playing in a, in a few minutes. Uh, it was actually uh, when John was interviewed by this guy here called uh, Gavin Esler. Um, you can see just by this photo that he's a person who means business. Uh, he is actually very well known or was very well known for how rigorously he researched his people and how rigorously he interviewed and interrogated people uh, during his time with journalism. He wasn't just on the BBC Hard Talk program, he was on a number of other programs as well. And in 2005, he was heavily criticised for how strongly he had interviewed uh, a couple of politicians with regards to the London bombings that had happened uh, around the same time and whether there was stuff that could be done to prevent it and so on and so forth. So he's not a man who shies away from controversy. And uh, he is a, a very, very good uh, reporter, a very, very good journalist. And for a while, he did a stint on BBC Hard Talk, which is a fairly well-known programme 
program here in the UK on the BBC. It tends to go out sort of late at night and it takes major events that are happening in the country or around the world, things that are relevant, uh, you know, obviously Ukraine war. There was a lot of stuff about the Ukraine war when that first happened. Um, there was a, there was a load of stuff about climate change uh, during the you know the the the, the um, COP meeting that they had in Glasgow uh, a couple of years back. That kind of stuff, right? Things that are relevant, and they will get top news presenters and top journalists and sit them down with people who are relevant to what's going on in the news. And basically, some of it is a discussion, some of it is an interrogation, some of it is a let's really break this down and question you about this. Uh, and it's still a program which is going on today. Now, John, I'm going to let you talk for a little bit and just, just want to get a bit of a background as to how did you end up on the BBC doing this program, uh, a bit about how you prepared for it and some of the stuff that you did and what the experience was kind of like actually going on to this this BBC show. Okay, well, I'm going to get Sam to hold up one of our forerunners to this program. Sam, do you hold up that DVD video um, called Creation, The Final Proof? This is one that we put together in Australia for a university lecture at Griffith University. Dr. Diane Eager and I worked together on the content, and it really does ask, given that creation is true, what would the evidence be? Thanks, Sam. And you can put up the website uh, where folks can get that. You can now get it as a stream content. You can download it. You can do all sorts of things these days, which didn't even exist. They hadn't been created. You catch the play on words. Uh, when we first put that together, we had to create the video itself. And our studio man there, our film photographer was Dean, and he'll be with me today at the new uh, event at Creation Discovery Centre here in Queensland, Australia, filming not just on our iPhone like that uh, bit that Diane and I did, which showed before with a, a bit of undersound and a bit of uh, not exactly in focus stuff, but in reality, we'll be filming it and creating a new file. Did you catch the word again? Because we are so used to using that word, many people use it where they actually um, think evolution means the same thing. No, creation means to make something that could not make itself. So we'd become rather famous around the ridges because of our insistence not just to attack evolution. I mean, come on, let's be honest. David Attenborough shows are so pathetic in terms of science uh, content. Oh, they're great evidence for creation to the point where one girl contacted us and said, I became a Christian through watching David Attenborough's shows on evolution because his shows demonstrated so much the beauty and glory of God as creator. Um, you can't run away from it. Even when you are promoting evolution, you are really talking about the evidence for creation. So we'd become notorious, if you like, because we'd appeared on BBC radio. You know, they have regional radios uh, all, all across England. We'd been on BBC radio quite a bit. And we'd got a bit of a reputation. So in the lead up to uh, Darwin's anniversary, we became sort of a, a top of the pile to pick and try to throw at. And uh, so that, that's sort of the background there. Diane, would you like to add anything more in our preparation for uh, all of this stuff that led up to uh, Gavin Esler's interview? Yes, it was around the time of the Darwin anniversary. Uh, it was a big anniversary for uh, Darwinists. It was the 150th anniversary of Darwin's birth. Uh, so it was happy birthday, Charles Darwin, you're 150. And it was also the anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species, which was published in 1859. So it was a double anniversary. So there was a lot of talk about evolution, about Charles Darwin um, and his legacy. So there was quite a bit of interest in it. And uh, we were in the UK for that, um, giving some presentations and lectures and meetings uh, so because it was topical in the just general uh, media the BBC actually took it up rather than ignoring us as being a bit sort of uh, fringy out there uh, now to, to go one step further uh, mm. we had done a lot of debates in England uh, you yeah. may remember a few weeks ago I shared how I am absolutely convinced God called me to England and to preach over there and teach over there. I only regret COVID and a few other health issues with my wife at the moment that sort of 
holds us back here in Australia. But the Lord opened lots of doors and many of the professors wanted to debate. And uh, to be honest, praise the Lord for the victories he gave us. Because I'll be honest, here in Australia, the tactic taken by uh, Professor Plymer and some of the others was attack, 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 then ignore. Uh, have us on the radio, but cut us off before we got a chance to reply. So in England, however, it was a little bit more gentlemanly, you know, a bit of the scholarly ancestral background. Um, but at least I got to debate professors at Oxford, mm -hmm. professors at Cambridge, heads of geology societies, to, to talk to the Geological Association in St Andrews and in Oxford, etc. It became a real background. So the BBC obviously heard about this. And uh, Joe, they invited us on to what, what would you say the rating of this hard talk program was? Uh, it is one of the most um, prestigious interview-based um, journalism programs. It's more than just the news, because in the news it's very kind of scripted, right? And yes, they may interview some people on the news, but it's, we're going to speak of this, we're going to talk about that, and that's about it, right? Uh, and you speak your view and that's it. Very little interaction. This was basically 30 minutes of just a presenter who's done his research and a person who has been basically not briefed on any kind of content or where they're going, sat down and, and grilled, basically spoken about it, usually experts on, on, on the certain topics or people who have been involved or are promoting a certain topic. Uh, and so it's it's really known as kind of like the the the, the height of uh, you know journalism in terms of getting everybody together in one room and and, and, and interrogating them. So it's uh, it's 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 pretty prestigious when it comes to sort of news programs. Joe, the word you used there was absolutely correct, interrogating. I, I'll be honest, I had been warned that this bloke, I'd never met him before, took no prisoners. He was out to uh, give you the third degree, the fourth degree, the fifth degree, and any other degree he could to get behind the scenes and expose you with any weaknesses. And mm. since Joe asked me before, what preparation did we do? Number one, I, I determined to know my subject. Now, my subject was not anti-evolution, right? Catch that. Yeah. All of you creations who are listening out there, by all means, know the weaknesses of the theory of evolution because they are everywhere, right? But for, for, for Evan's sake, for Jesus' sake, for the Creator's sake, for creation's sake, for creationism's sake, know what you're talking about in terms of the positive. If the evidence for creation is so clear, and that is the Bible's teaching, sad shame on you theologians who say this is an unimportant issue when the New Testament says it's so clear everybody will be judged on it, right? Read Romans chapter 1. Everybody from David Attenborough set will be judged on the basis of how they've accepted or rejected God's stand on creation. And so we made an absolute keystone of our ministry to know what the answer to that question was, whether it be chemistry and the origin of life, whether it be geology and the evidence for creation and the evidence for the flood, or just a little bit of background. It was the evidence for creation that got me first, right? That, that when I asked, well, if creation is true, what would the evidence be? I weren't, wasn't there at the time of creation. The rocks are here now. So they reflect that the very best, something that got creatures into the rocks. And the answer would have to be showing up somewhere. Things were created after their own kind. In other words, whatever starfishes are like now, they've always been, or due to degeneration, they may have died out, all of them or some of them. So that's what I went looking for. And that's what really occurred. And that's what we can actually share on the BBC. Now, the thing that's most exciting about this is, A, you can still get a copy of the background research, Creation of Final Proof. It is still absolutely effective in winning people, both to creation, to creator, and to Christ as Saviour. And you'll find it is just as effective in debates against professors. So grab a copy, download it, search for it, etc. Uh, look at all that background research. But you'll be fascinated as you see the effect this has on... Uh, Gavin Esler. Two more things, I guess, before we play the program. When Joe asked me, how do I prepare? A, I know my stuff. B, I know my enemy. 
Um, but Gavin didn't represent any position except antagonism. So here was my preparation. Lord, you're smarter than this guy. Give me wisdom in dealing with this guy so that people will actually listen to what I have to say. Give, give me grace. Give me wisdom. And I'll, I'll be, be blunt to you out there. We're not going on the attack to destroy Gavin. We're actually trying to help him to ha open his eyes to see what the evidence of creation actually is. And watch a little way into the program and notice a remarkable change in this guy's attitude, which really opened the door for us to take and <laughs> take it and run with it, which is really great. Oh, and by the way, as Joe said, we have the whole program unedited and there's some fascinating things at the end. Isn't that correct, Joe? That is indeed correct. So in just a moment, we're going to be playing that and you will see it is the complete role, right? The one that wasn't actually ended up showing on the, obviously it was shown on the BBC. It did actually go out. This is uh, when you go onto the BBC, uh, historically as well, this has happened with the BBC, you will get a complete unedited full version of your interaction with the BBC, uh, whether it's you're interviewed on the news or whether you're on the radio or whatever, right? And uh, this ended up um, probably with, uh, with uh, our previous um, you know, UK representative, and it got ended up in the archives, and we've just come across it. Uh, but it's it's quite fascinating because the you know the title credit goes, the interview happens, it's long, and then it goes to black. But stay around, right? There's about ten seconds mm. of blackness, if that. But stick around because the camera carries on rolling, and. Uh, Gavin and John have a little bit of a, a chat and that's very interesting. And then they say goodbye to John and show him out the door. And then Gavin's still there talking about stuff. So listen right to the end because you get a little bit of an insight into how he thought the interview went. And uh, you'll get a little bit of an insight into how what he thought about John Mackay. And it is very, very interesting. So make sure you watch all the way to the end. Um, I think without any further ado, are we ready to watch it, John? I reckon so. Very good. Let's go. Enjoy, everybody. And uh, also a reminder that this will obviously be going out on our YouTube channel at about uh, 11 o'clock this evening, UK time. It's been about an hour or so. Uh, it'll be going out as well for you to watch and catch up again. But sit back, relax, and enjoy this program. Hello and welcome to Hard Talk, I'm Gavin Esther. My guest today is one of the world's leading proponents of creationism, the belief that God created man as outlined in the Bible around 6,000 years ago. Mainstream scientists regard the world as four billion years old and view creationism as unscientific nonsense, or more politely, as a quaint expression of fundamentalist religious faith. So why is there renewed interest in a theory swept aside by Darwin 150 years ago? John Mackay, welcome to Hard Talk. G'day, Gavin. Good to be here, mate. What, why is there a renewed interest in creationism? Well, I guess we've had, as you said in your introduction, 150 years since Darwin apparently swept away all opposition, but you've got to the point where stars like Richard Dawkins are being asked on PBS in the USA, is evolution a theory or a fact? And he basically says, well, it, it's been observed. It just hasn't been observed while it's been happening. Now, as the leading proponent of sort of atheistic evolution, that leaves an awful lot open to question. So people like me are saying, look, it's time we dealt with the real world, not the one that you theoretically want. The one bit, let's, let's start on one point of agreement. Yeah. One bit that scientists would agree with you on is there are ways of picking holes in Darwin's theory. Definitely. They would say that, but yes. the question is whether what you have to advance takes us uh, any further. Who comes to your meetings? Who wants to hear your point of view? Well, I just flew in from Hungary on Saturday night and we had a meeting with Hungarian academics, one professor of information technology at the University of Miskolc, one leading physicist, and one geneticist. So obviously you get the academic spectrum as well, which is 
you know, a fairly new interest, often in, in, in the last 150 years. So not years, just it's Christian been lay people who are largely Christian, but now it's mm. moving to the university academics because they've got to the point of saying chance, random, naturalistic explanations are simply not working. Now, I gave a, a one-line definition mm -hmm. of creationism. I want you to explain a bit about what you do believe. You believe that, what, every word in the Bible is literally true, it's the truth. Well, the biblical account, of course, is a book which got, got history in it. It's a book which got parables in it. So if something's a parable by definition, it's a story, not, not a historical fact. And Jesus always introduced his parables with that phrase. But there's much of it which actually claims to be history. And as such, it deserves to be treated as that. I mean, Charles Darwin's book is a book which claims to be history. And you've got two alternative histories to which any science student can say, if this history is true, what evidence would it leave in the present? But you, you believe, am I correct in saying, literally, that the world was created about 6,000 years yeah, ago by I God in six that days? A literal reading of Genesis is not only the only one that makes sense. If you try to read it any other way, it just becomes a stupid story, not even of any value to religion. But there, you're in conflict with other religious believers. Never mind the scientists, for a start. You're in conflict with some religious believers right on that point. Un you're happy with undeniably, that. I'm quite happy with that. Where does, in your scheme of things, Neanderthal man fit in? Where does, where does all that fit in? Are we or are we not somehow descended from him and through him to the apes? Well, I think we can definitely rule out us being descended from Neanderthal now because, you know, we've got fancy genetic testing and he has at least 19 units on each uh, genetic unit different from us so if you wanted to be dogmatic he's come from us we haven't come from him but genetic testing shows that 96 percent of the dna of a chimp is common to a human doesn't it well that's so the we've got figure. That in that's the figure you get in textbooks but number one neanderthal is not a chimp neanderthal has been removed from the display at the naturalist museum because he turns out to be a deformed human being well, maybe it's a dead end but but, but on, on, on the question on the question of our relationship with chimps and so on, 96% of the DNA common between a chimp and a human. That okay. tells you something, doesn't it? It does tell you something. It tells you that statistics is the house of lies, as most politicians have realised for quite a while. So that if you want to say 96% of what, or actually the common figure is now 98.4% the same, if you're dealing with, say, 100 yards or 100 metres and you're throwing a cricket ball and you're happy to be plus or minus 1 per 6 per cent, it really doesn't matter mm, but much. If, but, many, many but if people you are dealing mm. with 10,000 miles or 10,000 kilometres, 1.6 per cent becomes significant. So let me apply it to you. We're talking about the genetic code. It's got lots and lots of genetic bits of information in it. What does 1.6 per cent mean when it comes to code? OK, I'll give you two sentences to illustrate how codes work if you change your percentage. God is now here and God is nowhere have 100% identical letters in 100% the same order and they are 100% different in meaning. So when it comes to code, just using the percentage similarity is a meaningless no, but no, argument. No one is saying that we are chimps, but they are saying that if 90-something percent of our DNA is similar to that of a chimp, then there may be some relation, just as God is now here and God is nowhere, are clearly sentences yes. in the English language using letters. And that they were is very created. similar. They that were created the sentences. You see, the reality is when you look at the genetic code of the chimp and the genetic code of the human being, one reason you're talking to me and not a chimp is that 1.6% difference really is unbelievably significant. And if folks go to our creationresearch.net website, you will find the latest difference amounts to 35 million different letters at least. Where in your scheme of things do fossils and dinosaurs come in? Because as you know, scientists believe the world is about 4 billion years old. Fossils predate homo sapiens, human beings? Well, the one thing I'm encouraging all English educators to do is to teach people the history of each scientific discipline. And what we call geology, the word was invented by the Bishop of Durham, six-day creationist Noah's Flood. Our basic precepts of geology from Nicholas Stino, six-day creationist Noah's Flood. Our basic identification as fossils, as real animals, are uh, really Nicholas Steno applying Christian belief that God is real, the world is real. If it looks like a shark teeth, God is now to deceive us. That's where our concept of fossils comes from. The rest is the attempt of people to remove the real reason we got to understand fossils and now evolution but as a When result. people find fossils and say by carbon dating these are several million years old, you think they are lying to you? 
Well, number one, they wouldn't use carbon dating to do that, but the principle is the same. I don't accuse them of lying. What I accuse most people of is ignorance of how we got to that figure. And every student in a high school or a university needs to know how we got that figure. And I'll tell you how we did. You see, the man that we can really put at the centre of this is a person called Charles Lyell, who wrote the Bible of geologists in the 1800s, gave us a set of glasses that says the present is the key to the past. Knew nothing about carbon-14, but we use his glasses. Whatever carbon-14 is doing, it's always done. OK, Charles Lyell was a lawyer who, fortunately for us, his sister published his letters two years after he died. We know what he set out to do now. Quote, unquote, my aim is to get rid of Moses from science. OK, now there's the problem, not the data. Okay, but you accept that dinosaurs did exist? Oh, I dig them up. I run you field did, trips. Exactly. Come on, you, one of my field trips. I'd love, Gavin, I'd love you'll to. Enjoy I'd love it. to. I'm sure I would. You accept dinosaurs exist. Yeah. If everything was created as the Book of Genesis said, there must have been dinosaurs in Noah's Ark. Definitely true. So Triceratops and Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus in Noah's Ark. No problem with that. Big Ark. You <laughs> Very well, big Ark. Well, look, I, I did, for your sake, bring along <laughs> something to uh, show you today. There is a cast of a baby dinosaur footprint. So there were baby dinosaurs ah, in Noah's Ark. Ah, dinosaurs, relatives of crocodiles, were born out of eggs yeah. about the same size. But so no problem with baby dinosaurs. You, do, you, do you see my point? Well, you would have thought it might have been mentioned. You know, these would be rather spectacular well, animals. Well, I wouldn't look for the word dinosaur because it wasn't no. invented till 1841. But what I would look for, you see, the word dinosaur was invented by a creationist and they didn't tell you that at school and they should have. But you are saying there were dinosaurs in Noah's Ark. Yeah, quite no clear. problem. Except I think they were called dragons in those days. Dragons. OK, but the science, as you put it, of creationism, this is where many people have difficulties mm -hmm. with what you say. They're perfectly... Your beliefs, whatever you believe, whatever I believe, what anybody watching believes is all acceptable. It's when you start to say there is a scientific basis for this. What is the evidence for what you have to say? OK, I asked Steve Jones this on a radio program just a couple of weeks because he's so antagonistic to creation. I said, Steve, if creation is true, what would the evidence be? And there was stunned silence. OK, and most of us have never even asked that question. But a the person I did a debate with from Harvard University, Professor Krista Carlos, gave a brilliant answer. He said, a creation is anything that can't happen by itself. Now, the students in this country, the professors need to think that through. And here's the answer. A creation is something that can't happen by itself. In other words, the end product will have properties that do not come from the stuff it's made of. Because if evolution is true, the end product is simply the sum result of the natural properties of the universe. But as I suggested to you before, there is an argument with scientists, which mm -hmm. we'll leave aside just for one second. The argument within religion is one between you, for example, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, who says, I think creationism is, in a sense, a kind of category mistake, as if the Bible were a theory like other theories. Whatever the biblical account of creation is, it's not a theory alongside other theories. There's no, not... it never claims to be right. a science book, and it never claims to be a religious book either. What it claims to be is the truth. The and truth if for scientists all time. are interested in truth, then you have to be able to answer if a creation happened, how would you recognise it? Why do, uh, but uh, not just the Archbishop of Canterbury, also within the Church of England, one of the scholars, Stephen Sykes, says that the Church has come to terms with evolution. Evolution is not incompatible with a divine God. Absolutely not. Do you think it is incompatible with divine God? Well, I debated uh, Professor Polkinghorne last year in Liverpool Cathedral, a vast audience there, and the, the reality is he lost. He was trying to defend God could use evolution and the simplest argument doesn't come from a Christian, it comes from an atheist by the name of Jacques Monod, who basically said the most vicious, cruel, mindless process of e is evolution. Application, what sort of a God, like the God of the Bible, would use millions of years of death, struggle, kill or be killed, and have the audacity to call it good? Well, now, so it's incompatible oh, now, with hold, the Christian now, God. Now, hold on. Uh, uh, as you well know, we live in a world of malaria, of mm -hmm. AIDS, of mm -hmm. terrible, b terribly bad things. If there is a God who is good and is all-powerful and these evil things exist, he precisely fits into the definition you've just given. No, he doesn't. You see, well, this is David Attenborough's problem and Charles Darwin's problem. I mean, Charles Darwin... So I'm in good church. company with that question. Oh, yeah, you're, you're in good but, company, but, that's but right. Why, why not, then, if you said that a God would never create a world which is red in tooth and claw, well, he's created okay. a world in which there's AIDS. You've got a world in which God made the world very good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. 
And I've still asked you the question, as I ask all the other scientists, if that is the beginning, how would you recognise the evidence? And they refuse to answer it. But your question is the next step. You see, he warned us there was one thing we were not allowed to do. And the biblical record says we did it. And the penalty of our disobedience has been to go from good to bad to worse. Uh, you want an application of it? Well, I'm for, sorry to interrupt there, but if that were true, then it could also be that the penalty for disobeying is evolution. That has produced no, no, no. the world no, no, the penalty for disobeying is devolution. Well, the it change, change. Change. No, no, no devolution, problem evolution. with that so at all. So you accept this notion of change. Oh, then you yes. Can, then devolution, evolution, you can accept. Oh, no, no, no. You see, I had a debate at Nottingham University last week, uh, sorry, the week before, and he was doing this. Evolution is change. Therefore, any change is proof of evolution. I said, sorry, if you start out with a perfect creation, any change is degenerative. So that you can start out in a world in which all the bacteria in your mouth have a wonderfully good job mm -hmm. to do, and then you in your foolishness invent soft drinks with phosphoric acid in them and you kill off well, half the bacteria and they chew your jaws instead well, lay of lay off the, the good stuff. But, but you accept that God created the world, you accept that evil exists after the fall, you accept that that is a profound yep. change and yet yes. you don't accept evolution on the grounds that God would be cruel to create a world red in tooth and claw. It's no, no, more no. Cruel, no more cruel for animals to kill each other than it is for people to die of AIDS. But you see, Genesis tells you when the world was good, all the creatures ate plants. There was no death, no struggle. So the archbishop who wants evolution and God to go together is not talking about the God of biblical Christianity. And it's a key point. Let me, let me ask you about the God of, of Christia Christianity in the Bible. Leviticus um, 25, 44 to 46, you may very well be familiar with this, talks about slavery. Mm -hmm. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen, and ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you. That was used to justify slavery. Passage from the Bible, very controversial. Okay, and the context is Moses? And the well, the context, yes. Tell us about the context. Okay, the context is Moses, and Moses is invading the land of Canaan, and the Canaanites, well, the basic rule is they had absolutely rebelled against God and the penalty of sin is death. They deserve death, right? The reality is if they are kept alive, you need to keep reading what the rules for slavery were. But, but if you had a day off, they had a day right, off, right? right? If you were treated fairly, they were treated as, fairly. As you, so biblical slavery and the sort you saw in America in the Civil are War. totally different. Exactly. In the 19th century, that passage was used to justify slavery. Yeah. And I'm suggesting to you that the context is indeed all. Your it argument is. is absolutely right. The context is indeed all. The context of the book of Genesis is also all. Which Absolutely is a agree. very, very important story, no but problem. it is not contextually scientific evidence of the ah, origins of no, the universe. No, no, no. You see, what, what you've just done is turned it on its head. So you're saying, I can take Charles Darwin's story about well, history when he wasn't Charles there. Darwin. No, 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 we're, we're, I can't. we're into God at the moment. We're yeah, into but God. the reality is you're using the same thing backwards. You see, Charles Darwin has a story about a time when he wasn't there and you're saying that's scientific and I can ask a no, question about I, it. I'm saying if context is important for mm -hmm. the Leviticus justification yes. of slavery, then context is also important for understanding the book of Genesis. No Very doubt about it. And if you agree with that, then you can agree perhaps that the book of Genesis is to be read for what it is, not a scientific document. Good. It, but it never claims to be a science it, document. Exactly. It claims to be the truth. Uh, the truth. The truth about history. And you know that because? Simply because all the rest of the book treats it that way. So when Jesus is asked a question about yes. a social issue of divorce, he says, haven't you read? Back in the right. beginning, God made them male but and female. the truth in context, the same as the justification for slavery, Presumably you accept that he gave you reason to be able to Definitely. argue with me in this discussion. He gave you reason to look at the book of uh, rationality, to look at the book of Genesis and say, yes, this is very important to me, but it's not science. But it is history. And you see, that's what evolution claims to be. And if this history is true, molecules turn into amoebas, which turn into politicians, then how would I find the evidence to verify it? If this history is true, God took dust and he made man. If that history is true, what would the evidence be? And you see, so far, the scientists refuse to even go there, but they are the same category of question. Would you accept there may be scientific evidence that you could accept that would prove you were wrong? Oh, I can definitely even suggest it. You see, when you have a look at our classification system, invented by a creationist, 
right? Carl von Linn, who says if God has created creatures separately, if he has specially created them, concepts like species are real, right? And it works. Now, the bottom line is, if it is true that amoebas turned into worms that became politicians, then animals have not produced their own kind and you've got a way of checking. If it is true that God has created things to produce their own kind, then somewhere built into a human being is a mechanism to stop you evolving. And nobody has observed any human being evolving. What we've seen is our immune system degenerating, courtesy of AIDS, courtesy of the environment, courtesy of Chernobyl, and that's the opposite of evolution. Make a distinction, if you would, between what you were talking about here and what is very current in the United States now, which is the concept of intelligent design, which yeah. I've seen people refer to as creationism light. <laughs> is that fair I enough? I like that. That's well, really good. I'll remember that. <laughs> uh, I, I was asked about this by the academics in Hungary just on Saturday because they, uh, they have a traditional, far more European, Greek-type thinking academia than the Americans do. And you will find in America where, of course, they draw a line in the sand that we don't really have, separation of church and state. So if anything's even re vaguely related to church, like Genesis, you can't bring it over here to the state school system or whatever. So they've come up with the argument. I mean, have a look at my boomerang. <laughs> Everybody this was for. who walks into the room believes that didn't get here by accident. <laughs> Somebody who existed before it, Somebody who's not a part of it, somebody who is smarter than it, actually use their intelligence to make wood do what it won't normally do. You see, it's not the wood that makes this come back. It's the shape and the design. So this is evidence of intelligent design on a small scale. So everyone can recognise the evidence of intelligent design. And this group of scientists is saying, random chance, natural processes, time, just doesn't work. Because when we look at life, say DNA, it's made of carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, phosphorus, etc., which don't do codes. You can leave them around for a million, zillion years if you like, they don't do codes. But DNA is coded. So it's got information in it which reflects intelligence greater than you can get from the parts. So these group are saying, we want to say we need to admit intelligence has been used in the operation of the universe. Unlike me, they don't want to go further and identify which intelligence we're talking well, about. So it's a bit of a con then? I wouldn't say it's a con, I would say it's a very American phenomena. Because <laughs> you, you, you think it's a con, you're just not prepared to say. No, I, I don't think it's a con, I think they're trying to play the ball game in the park that's been defined for them, whereas my s suggestion is, look, the park is not science versus philosophy, it's not science versus religion, it's truth versus error. Shift the game over here. Do you want, do you want what you were talking about to be taught in schools not as part of religious education or philosophy, and I think there'd be no argument that it would be, mm -hmm. but as part of science. Do you want it taught in the science curriculum? In well, I, I've been coming to Britain for 20 years and I've been teaching this in your science classes, your philosophy classes, and your religion classes, right? And yes, you can do it in all three. I did a debate against four professors in Canada, all at once, all science professors largely, except for the ecumenical clergymen. And the result of that was the local school board said, come and show us how to do this. So if anybody goes to creationresearch.net, clicks on the study guide, they can download the course we use in science classes here or in America. Scientists think you are talking rubbish. Yeah. That's why I asked Steve Jones, if creation is true, what would the evidence be? Stunned silence. He does not want to even think of the question. Let, let, let me put to you a couple of things that uh, well, Steve Jones, for example, of University College London said, it's very hard for anyone with two neurons bolted together to believe that the Earth was created 6,000 years ago. Deliberate irrationalism is dangerous, but it's most dangerous to the people that believe it. Well... That's certainly Steve Jones' opinion based on his atheistic approach to, to nature. But he's the same Steve Jones who in his Royal Society lecture said, we've got fossil HIV from 1959, variation XYZ. And by 2006, it became HIV variation WPK. And he said, if that's not descent with change, what is? Now, the reality is HIV has turned into HIV. It's produced its own kind. 
and there's no evolution at all. Well, it's not, it's not just him, obviously. The Royal Society of the Best Scientific yeah. Brains in Britain said in April this year, young people are poorly served by deliberate attempts to withhold, distort and misrepresent scientific knowledge and understanding. And they say that uh, what we know about Earth is not, what you're talking about is not consistent with the wealth of evidence for evolution. The American Association for the Advancement of Science takes a similar point of view. I mean, the, the scientific establishment says you're completely wrong. Well, do you know why they're getting worried? Because more and more of your professors who 20 years ago were young men and young women who have begun to think, hang on, I can answer that question now about creation. And I know you can't take a million years to make a boomerang because it'll rot. Are now professors in universities here. And despite all of the antagonism of the Royal Society, there's no doubt about it, creationism is having a bigger and bigger influence and will continue to do so. Do you, just to return to one theme that we began with at the start, do, do you accept that you may, at some point in your life, admit that you were wrong? I, I have a fairly good track record of if ever I find out that I've been wrong, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it, although with a bit of Scottish pride and that having to be broken first. But the reality is I've also adopted something that I, I said in one of your public schools just two weeks ago. Because the student said, why aren't you talking about this? I said, because in all of my 59 years on this planet, I've not been able to reach a conclusion about that. And what I haven't got a conclusion on, I will not tell you. Right? So therefore, I've made it my business, if I can answer the question about what the evidence for creation would be, the students need to know how to answer that question. Because schools should not exist to teach students what to think. They should exist to teach them how to think. That's why your faith schools are flourishing. I mean, your school boards have said the creation of schools are way up there. Why? Because they're teaching them how to think, not just what to think like the evolutionists are. John Mackay, on that note, thank you very much. Good on you, Kevin. <laughs>Just a reminder, folks, to keep watching because uh, after that, we'll come back to discuss it. But in just a second, we're going to be going into the post-interview discussion between uh, Gavin Esler and John, as well as some of his comments on John Mackay as well. So keep listening. And they used them until the Cowboys gave them six guns. Really? And the same Indians nice. had exactly the same creation story as the Aboriginal. Hmm, this is interesting. Yeah, no, the, uh, I, th I think... I think really yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you the funniest thing. I gave a lecture to the Geology Association of Oxford. They chose the topic, right, on, on the flood. And they harangued me like one thing, because this is so controversial, right? And uh, anyway, afterwards, the professor said, well, come and have a drink. I said, fine. Now, my finishing line for that talk was, <coughs> all around the world, every tribe has a traditional story about both creation and the flood. And I said, there's only one exception. It's the tribe called Geologists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. Oh, we, should, we should restart the recording. You're absolutely... That's... Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so anyway, but in, it, that, it in is that bar yeah. afterwards, he said, I admire <coughs> what you're doing, yeah. even if I disagree with it. And I said, why do you disagree with it? He said, well, I just couldn't accept it. I oh, said, no, that's a close... You've travelled all around the world. He said, yes, and I've noticed that they all have those stories. Yeah. And I said, but you oppose me publicly, you idiot. Oh, no. no, he's right, he's right. But you're right about it. But, but the interesting thing is that I have deba debated with creationists in America or intelligent design people who cannot conceive they could be long. Who can no, then if that's true, then you're not in the science business at all. You have to think through, if I'm wrong, what would the evidence what, the, be? And but you have to have learning how to think. Anyway, the sorry, we, well, we want to do another half hour, is that oh, right? Well, <laughs> not an alternative half hour, isn't <laughs> no, that? I enjoyed that very much, John, that was a Good pleasure. Question. Right. Right. <clears throat> I tell I tell you another thing, John. My uh, John, before you go, my uh, my my daughter is uh, always goes on and on and on about. We have this argument all the time about William Paley and uh, and yeah. the watchmaker. I will tell him about, about the uh, yeah, boomerang course. maker, which we'll tell will... Uh... About the course, because <laughs> what, what William Paley failed to do was actually define how you would recognise something that was deliberately designed. That's yeah. what he failed to do. He just argued logically. But if you but found it, it, once yeah. you found it, yeah. the, you took it from that point, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. But it's very, yeah, it's very interesting, because she, uh, she's, she's only 14, she's very interested mm. in this. Uh, she, in, uh, because in Cordoba in the 10th century, mm. 
the Jewish philosophers and the uh, Muslim philosophers who lived side by mm -hmm. side before the Spanish Catholics mm -hmm. kicked them out uh, were debating precisely yeah, this thing in the 10th century. Well, so have, a, have a look at the study guides and download the search guidelines because what we spend is how would you recognise this if it happened naturally, which mm -hmm. is evolution, or if it happened deliberately? And that's what the course is about. She will get a lot out of it. Right, thanks very much. No, I've got to do some work apparently, which is a bit of a drag. How do I do that? What do I do? Thank you. Somewhere here? Can I watch yeah. some tennis? Yeah, yeah. It, it's really quick. Oh, it's Murray year's. playing. It's last year's stuff. Yeah, I, so, yeah. I thought the weather looked a bit too good. <laughs> but was, has there been no play at all no. today? None at all. Well, I don't know about that. I, I was kind of pleased that it was going to be Wimbledon week, actually, because my garden could use the rain, and I knew that it's the only thing... Well, that was lively. Yes. You really got into that. Oh, I did really get into it. I think it's quite interesting. Interesting topic. That's a choice from the usual UN peace negotiator, isn't it? Yeah, but, he, but he's very different from, from talking to the American creationists, because the American creationists just, you know... God has spoken to me. I know what, everything about everything, and uh, that's the end of the world. But he came back each time. And yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I just thought that I could be here in the dark or I could stand I here in the light, but it's up to you, Rod, out. you know. Yes, he said it's a golden shot. <laughs> <laughs> golden shot, is that like golden goal? <laughs> so anyway, how boring are England on a scale of 0 to 10? What do you think? Oh, right, yes, we didn't write a trail, sorry. So. All right, folks, I think we're coming to the end of the uh, <coughs> hot mic session. Um, as it sort of wraps up to the end there. Hopefully you caught a little bit of the discussion between John and Gavin, as well as some of Gavin's comments uh, about John, which I think are quite revealing. But anyway, um, we've got about half an hour or so left on the program. And so what we're going to do, I think that's finished. Let's take that down now. There we go. Is um, just have a little bit of a rundown, a, a run of comments from the, from the team here as to what they thought about the program. Um, and then if we have any questions, from you guys uh, or comments from you guys as to what you thought about it, uh, then just stick them into the chat box because we will uh, deal with them as we go. But John, over to you. Bear in mind that, again, this is probably the, the, the only time you've seen this other than when it went out live on the BBC and, of course, when you were there uh, being interviewed. Um, what, are you, what are some of your takeaway points from, from this, having just sort of rewatched it? Oh, sorry, we're muted, John. Let me unmute you. There we go. Number one, I really, it says I'm still, un, I'm unmuted. Okay, you can hear me. Uh, I really enjoyed the interview. And again, I would encourage any of you Christians out there, do your preparation on your knees, right? So mm -hmm. ask God to open doors for you and uh, to, to enable you to be the one who gives forth rather than the host uh, grabbing the opportunity to strangle Christians to massacre the creationists and to behead um, <laughs> the, the dragons of, of, of truth, as it were. So I, I thought it went really well. And Gavin's, you will have noticed his change in attitude uh, about a third of the way through, which really basically handed the interview over to me as well. I'm only sad that you couldn't hear the rest of the interview uh, after, the, after the show was over and some of the things that he really enjoyed laughing at, etc because the, the point that needs to be made is that here you have one of the best interrogators on the BBC and 
he started out with his normal interrogation method. B, it obviously failed. C, he swapped track to make it more positive and it worked really, really well. Now, because of the BBC structure, you do need to know it was heard by about 25 million people. We asked the BBC, right? That was their figure, not ours, right? So that was an incredible uh, response to that. But you need also to know that as I left, the manager of the BBC met me, right, very, very upset, right, very upset and told me I would never again be invited to the BBC. Now, why do you think that was? It, the interview went really well. The whole program was positively received. Uh, it has to tell you an attitude, a government attitude that sort of holds the BBC up there, gives it some sort of independence. So it's become more socialist than the government could ever hope and sometimes very a, a, a problem to the government. But their, their attitude is, David Attenborough has to be right, has to be seen to be right, and even when he's wrong, we'll say that he's right. Um, and anybody who skillfully exposes Attenborough or the BBC's weaknesses must be stood on, stamped on, obliterated, um, uh, simply not allowed any exposure. So pray that all of these opportunities will reignite. Um, and people will be encouraged by the program. But yeah, at the same time, pray for our museums, which put this stuff mm. into public uh, view, uh, all the sort of stuff we talked about on there, including my dear old boomerang, which still carries around with me and makes exactly the same point. Intelligent design is needed to make an unintelligent object, but you have to be brave enough not to do the American intelligent design thing. You have to be brave enough to say, well, who had the intelligent design? And only your biblical record gives you the answer. All things are made by Christ. All things are made for Christ. He stamped his nature on the creation. And that's the point of it. It's not just the point of, oh, I believe in creation. The point is you believe in creation. Therefore, the creator has the right to tell you what's wrong. Uh oh, I've done what's wrong. Therefore, I've sinned, not by government definition, not by the BBC definition, but by the holy, righteous God's definition. And he has the right to judge and praise God, particularly our team knows that he is the saviour and the only way to be re reunited with the creator. Joe, that's probably a good enough memory from me. The bit that I really liked is, um, you know, we live in a in a culture in the West today, which is promoted to be one of tolerance and acceptance. Um, and that's kind of the take that the BBC particularly will do, right? We have to tolerate and accept while being very exclusive. So there's definitely hypocrisy that's going on. But uh, by the same token, this wasn't quite that in 2006 when you went on the program, right? Um, it wasn't It wasn't quite as, as strong as it is today, this kind of what you might call woke hypocrisy that's going on. But you could see the start of it because you said to me, hang on, he said to you, John, in the interview, uh, hang on, that'd put you at odds with most religions. And your response was, yes. And he didn't really know where to go, <laughs> to go with that. <laughs> it's like, we're very happy to be at odds with other religions that's the whole point and the bit which really got me is how often you drove it back to truth right and uh it was it's all about the bible doesn't claim to be a science textbook it claims to be truth it doesn't matter what your opinion is gavin it's what is actually truth it doesn't matter what steve jones's opinion is or david attenborough's or anything it's what is actually truth and that's really where we need to drive it back to and as you've said several times already tonight um that's where if anybody's wanting to prepare for debates or if anybody's going to get involved in debates or anything bashing evolution is very fun but ultimately the core of it needs to be about truth and pointing people to truth who is jesus christ otherwise you're just having an argument for argument's sake and it's really not going to get you anywhere um are there any comments from the rest of the team about that uh, program that we just watched before yeah. we uh, move over to some questions yeah i'd like to make a comment joe and just on how um scientific facts or so-called scientific facts can change over time so so that program was like what 15 16 years ago or something mm -hmm. and uh, the the known knowledge at that time was that uh chimps and humans were 96 percent i think he said similar in their dna yeah. 
Well, little was it known amongst most of us that um, the, the people coming up with those calculations were ignoring what they called junk DNA, um, which we now know is not junk at all and is very important um, uh, DNA in the functioning of uh, organisms. And it's, it's down something below 80%. It's in the 70s, I think, 77% or something like that now, which, it, which now brings it to an enormous difference between humans and apes. So, yeah, just uh, time, time tells on so-called scientific facts. Well, on the back of that, Craig, uh, it's important to bear in mind that the entire human genome had only been theoretically sequenced three years before. And I say theoretically sequenced because, of course, that was part of the Human Genome Project. But I was at an academic conference in which uh, there were the, the, the Keystone Lecture. This was just a few weeks ago. The Keystone Lecture was about the Human Genome Project. And he basically, the main lecturer who was heavily involved in actually doing the Human Genome Project, made the very simple point that the Human Genome Project taught us one thing. We didn't know really what we were doing or anything about the genome. <laughs> and sort of 15 to 20 years later, uh, in fact, it's been 20 years since the Human Genome Project has been finished, and that was part of why they were sort of celebrating that, mm. um, that we are still using the Human Genome Project's results as the scaffolding for understanding the human genome. And his point was, it's so clunky. It, it is missing massive amounts of information and structure. We really need to redo this all, given our current understanding of it. And I wouldn't be surprised if it completely revolutionized our understanding of the way that DNA works and completely uh, is completely different to the way that we envisaged it back in 2003. Because effectively, so research that's 20 years old is now our authority on it. And it wasn't that long in the grand scheme of things before DNA and the structure of DNA was first discovered. So like you say, new stuff is happening all the time and that's good. But when and it's getting more complicated. And it's, it's getting, getting more and more complicated. Exactly. Yeah. It's getting extremely. But when you open up a textbook, right, uh, on evolution and they are arguing about these quotes between humans and chimps, they're arguing about the evolution of the DNA. And not only are they using arguments that are 20 years out of date, sometimes they're even 150 years out of date or even older, because yes, you still open up textbooks and you can still see things like the peppered moths. You can still see things like Haeckel's fraud with the embryos. And you just think, man, this is supposed to be, you know, cutting edge science that we're teaching our young people. And really it's frauds and stuff that is way, way, way out of date. But the last thing I'll mention before I hand back over to the news is even though we are now, you know, 20 years on with the research, and like you said, Craig, the differences is becoming more and more vast and DNA is becoming more and more complicated, the point that John made still stands, right? Because you notice John didn't try and tackle or argue away or get really complicated about the exact nuances between the similarity between humans and apes. All he did is make the very simple point, statistics is the king of lies, right? And really, when you're dealing with the enormous difference that we know that there is, case in point, him and Gavin were sitting there having a chat, that code can only come from a created being. And so you've just blown evolution out of the water, regardless of how similar or dissimilar we are. It's got everything to do with the fact that it started as a created code. Um, any other comments from the team? Uh, Joe and... Uh... Craig, just to illustrate one point of, that you've just made, but in practice, I did a debate against a geology professor in New Zealand, and he just won the most prestigious prize for science in, in the whole of New Zealand, the Rutherford Prize. And uh, he, he brought up during the debate, um, but look, all of this uh, junk DNA, the same sort of argument, right? Uh, doesn't do anything. Surely God wouldn't waste his time uh, on junk stuff. This this must be proof of evolution by chance, generating junk stuff. And I said, please remember what we used to say about the appendix. Because when I was a student in high school, the textbook said the appendix does nothing. Therefore, it must be left over. Therefore, said the teacher, no God in his right mind would make a an organ that doesn't do anything. Um, so they went on to use this non-functional appendix as evidence of random chance evolution of life. And I said, just remember that now we know that the appendix does hundreds of things and many of them are done while the baby's in the womb. So it turns out to be an absolutely necessary 
um, object and the medical profession no longer just chops it out. I mean, you used to go into the hospital with a headache, so you, they chop your appendix out. They used to think that it just evolved as a leftover, so they chopped your appendix out. It evolved to make surgeons rich, said one doctor. So he chopped your appendix out and build national health. Uh, and, and tonsils. They, yeah, that's right. Now they don't do that because it's been discovered after many, many years of finding out, hey, we chopped these appendix out here. Look what's happened to Billy. The same thing's happened to Susie. Uh-oh, there's a connect the dots here. So they don't do it anymore. And I'm pleased to say that professor has had to eat his words. We now know junk DNA isn't junk anymore. It was an expression of evolutionary ignorance because they assumed the world happened by accident. Start with the other question. If God created man, then the appendix had a function. Let's go look for it. This is your key point so often, isn't it, Diane? Hmm. Yes, very much so. That was the problem with the so-called vestigial organs. They were just a tribute to our ignorance rather than our origin. And sometimes, as Craig said, we had to wait for the technology and the science to advance. So back in the uh, turn of the 18th to the uh, or the 19th to the 20th century we didn't have the technology to investigate um some of the uh, endocrine organs because they only produced chemicals in such tiny amounts we th then developed new techniques for studying these and we learned more so mm. um, the scientific approach is if you find something that you don't know how it works or it looks odd um, like some of the things that Richard Dawkins brings up about um, giraffe nerves and, uh, mm. and the uh, vertebrate eye and things like that. If something looks odd, the scientific approach is, well, let's do some more research and find out. It's not to write it off as being a useless leftover, which is an excuse to uh, pour scorn on God rather than uh, make a scientific point. So we always have to remember there is a link between what you believe about God and what you believe about human beings and what you believe about the real world. Science and religion cannot be separated because how you interpret science depends on what worldview that you've got. The other interesting thing I thought came up in that, uh, in that interview was um, the interviewer tried the technique that, oh, you know, 50 million scientists think that you're wrong, therefore you must be wrong. Uh, truth is not determined by a majority view uh, and it's not determined by the qualifications of the people who promote a particular idea. Uh, as Joseph said, the, the issue here is what is the truth? If something is not true, it will not be made true by being said by a professor. If something is true, it doesn't matter who says it, even if it's said by someone with no formal education. And uh, so that's what must be the object of our research. What is true? And if you really want to know that, you need to go to the one who is the truth. And, yeah. and I, I remember one of my lecturers once saying regarding the statistics of things, um, don't you know that 90% of mass murderers eat tomatoes, yet this dangerous fruit is still on the market? <laughs> So, you know, so so that, that's the way statistics are often used, and John's point on that was really good. Yeah, it is. Um, having done a, a a entire year of statistics for science, you come out of that just thinking, yeah, yeah. <laughs> half of science is just built up on lies. There's no other really way you can come about it. It's based on oh, we suspect that this is the correct way, so we're going to stick with that one. But it could be uh, as many other ways as you wish to choose when it comes to statistics. Anyway, um, if there aren't any more comments, uh, let's have a couple of questions before we wrap things up from Sam. If there are any thank yous or questions, now's the time to deal with them. So, Sam, over to you. No, I think we're muted, Sam, somewhere. I'm not hearing anything. No, not getting anything from you, Sam. That's fine. Well, while Sam, no, I've got nothing there, Sam. While Sam uh, is trying to get the audio working back again, let's just bring up a question. We've got a question here from um, Shogiwa, which we will put up on the screen now. Nothing on two. Oh, there we go. Now you're back. There yes, we Sam, go. That's good. I'm yeah. back. Yeah. I'm back. Right, uh, right. Uh, we'll hide that for the for the second because we need to do some thank yous first. 
Um, so we'll go down the list. Uh, so we've got Lynn Colson coming in uh, with a super chat for 30 New Zealand buckaroos. Thank you, Lynn. God bless you. Uh, we've also got uh, Neil coming in as well with uh, 10 British buckaroos. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, we've also got as well a... Uh, was there another one? I can't, no, I can't remember if there was... Really had... Oh, yeah, here we go. I'm Matt. <laughs> uh, a super sticker for four US buckaroos. A pair character exaggeratingly stretching his arm forward to offer a cup of coffee. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's not a creation conversation stream without the pair character. It's become yes. a bit of a... I Bit think a... we did have, I think because we had to uh, refresh or something or other, but I did th I do think we had a uh, pre-stream super chat from Doki Doki as well, but I oh. can't see it on my thing. Well, way back Doki, I'm but sorry. I can't, thank you I can't much. see it. Yeah. If you did, thank you. We if had not. some uh, We had some soft yeah, did, yeah. issues trying to put it together, but there we go. Okay. Okay. All right, let's have some questions, Sam, before we... Uh, All right. Um and also as well, I'll just say, comment from me, well done, John, did really well. Um, but also, uh, disclaimer, um, all views expressed by Gavin Esler are his own and not associated with creation research. Those in the States who took offence by his comments can please send a complaint to the BBC, Broadcasting House, London, SW1, da 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 Whatever it is, yeah. Um, right, okay. You American creationists. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, right, okay, so let's do questions. So this one comes in from Shogu. Uh, question, how would you answer the objection to your Lego analogy? that it is a false analogy because evolution deals with self-replicating molecules, but Lego blocks are not self-replicating. Okay, I'll go first, and then Diane can have a crack at that one too. We also ask at our museum uh, <laughs> a, a what we thought would be a tough question, and the adults find it tough, but the kids find it easy. And the question is simple. How many Lego blocks would you need to prove creation? Now, the adults puzzle over that one and sort of think of the issues like you're raising Shogiwa, and the kids say, one. And when you ask them why one, and their answer is because Lego doesn't happen by itself. Now, when you are making the claim this is a false analogy because evolution deals with self-replicating molecules, we do not know any example of a hydrogen that makes copies of itself. We do not know any examples of a carbon that makes copies of itself. So the statement is false right at its bottom. There are no molecules that make copies of themselves uh, simply starting from scratch. And to be honest, scratch in this case is nothing, right? Zero, zilch. There's not even space, right? So when you come to the evolutionists, don't be sidetracked by saying, but RNA can make copies of itself. No, RNA exists on a planet where there's already oxygen and water and things like that. Let's go back to the starting point. There's not even space, right? That is the starting point for the evolutionist. He loves to sneak in space and matter and all of these things as, as uh, for the millions of years of absolutely impossible circumstances before he has his RNA ready to go. So in reality, you will find that he's cheating big scale and hoping you don't notice it. So Shogiwa, there's no such thing as self-replicating -re space. There's no such thing as self-replicating hydrogen. There's no such thing as your question is based on. So it's a false analogy <laughs> to, to use yeah. that statement. Diane, any comments? Yes, well, what properties enable it to be self-regulating? In fact, um, not all molecules are self-regulating, so you need to ask the question, what's the difference between a self-regulating one and a non-self-regulating one? And the difference is the information that is actually coded in those self-regulating ones. Uh, so, in fact, that's more evidence for creation. It's not evidence for evolution. Mm. Well, 50 years ago, my parents gave me, a, a, to keep the Lego analogy going, um, one of those motorised Legos. And, um, you know, you could use it to do all sorts of things that Lego wouldn't normally do, I suppose. But the machinery inside that, the batteries and the, the motor inside that, um, was obviously intelligent design. And that's like the machinery, I suppose, of replication. Um, you have to explain how that comes about in the first place, which is basically what you've both been saying. Mm. Mm. 
I mean, ultimately, if you can't make something that's simpler than DNA do something that DNA does, it just speaks volumes to how designed DNA is. So it's, <laughs> at the well, it's a multi-step that, process anyway. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Well, DNA itself is 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 on four. It, it runs on four dimensions, so it's um, way beyond anything that we can try and try and comprehend with regards to computer coding. All yeah, right, well, DNA um, is not actually self-regulating. You it, it, on its own, it cannot regulate itself. It takes dozens of other molecules in order for it to to um, to be replicated. Uh, yeah, for sure. All right, Sam. Have we got any other questions before we wrap up? We do indeed. This is another show you are question. Thank you very much, show you are. So it's a two part uh, message. So I'll put the second part up in a second. Question unrelated. Uh, Andrew Snelling claims that ten different coal samples from from different layers were radiocarbon dated to the same age. Do you know of examples that were uh, like that, where the different secular age items under a different dating technique came out as the same age? Um, I personally don't know of any other examples, but I know plenty of examples where your coal, which is supposed to be slowly formed in a swamp, is also not just got carbon-14, which gives a fairly recent date, because carbon-14 doesn't give you vast ages. The coal has uranium particles in it, um, and this is fairly common in coal seams around the world. Um, just sort of kept quiet a bit, but you'll find there is uranium in coal, there's also gold in coal. So uh, um, the, the point that Andrew's making is very simple. If they come from different layers, they should have technically either no carbon-14 if they're too old, or they should have the same, a different carbon-14 if they form the different ages. And since they don't, uh, ipso facto, not only is the theory of slow formation wrong, uh, but you need to uh, say here carbon-14 acting is, is acting as a break on how old a you want what a claim the coal could actually be. Mm. Yep. Very mm. good. Any other comments from anybody or we'll move on. No. All right. Any other final questions, Sam, from uh, the chat? Um, not from the chat, but I've got one for John. Okay. I've got one for John. Um, was there a green room in the BBC? Did you have access? How was it? Say that again. Was there a was there a green room? Was it nice? Was it pleasant? Did you get free coffee? <laughs> <laughs> no, we did have a bookshop though that tried to help us pay the the cost of putting on the display. So thank you to all those who donate cups of coffee associated with ten British pounds or something like that. Keep it up because we need to pay for that green room eventually. Um, we actually, Sam, bring your own coffee when you come and visit us and uh, pray for this afternoon. But I'm I'm really serious about donations and that because the display centers are great the creation discovery center in england the creation discovery center in queensland now in tasmania or jurassic arc all exist and they all cost vastly more than uh, just turning up and mm. and running a meeting so we're really grateful for those of you who want to donate and there's many ways to do it so sam remind them how they can actually do that and uh, the various websites they can go to to donate etc uh, yes, you can donate here. If you go to creationresearchstore.com forward slash donate, you can donate straight to Aussie land. Uh, or if you go to creationresearch.net, you can click on your local uh, branch of creation research and donate there. <laughs> Indeed. And a couple of quick reminders then before we close up. Um, we have got this coming up uh, in a week or so's time, the Truth in Science Summer School, which we talked about last week. Go and watch the interview with Dr. Andy, or Professor rather, Andy McIntosh, um, <clears throat> who was on Creation Conversations last week and is actually uh, hosting the Truth in Science Summer School. And I will be doing uh, two sessions there amongst many other people from all over the UK. So that promises to be a really great session. So do go find out more about that on the truth in science website uh we will be putting up the bbc interview with gavin esler in about half an hour's time uh at about uh, 11 p.m uk time whatever that is around the world it's about 
30, 40 minutes away. Um, so do go and watch that as well. And again, same as the Richard Dawkins one, spread it around. Let people know about it. Like, share, uh, post it on your uh, social media. Let people know about it. Post it into forums and groups and really get it out there and get it shared around because it'll be great to get as much watching hours uh, and to get this content out there as much as possible. So it will go a little bit viral, would be lovely. But anyway, share it around and let people know about these kind of programs. We're so privileged and thankful to the Lord that we've been able to find it after all these years and we didn't even really know that it existed. Um, because one, I don't know if we, I can't remember if we mentioned earlier, John, but um, if you want to go onto the onto the BBC website, can you find a, a lovely page where it talks about your time on the BBC? Um, no, not really. It, we've no. searched and searched and it seems all memory has been eliminated of John Mackay appearing on the BBC, but I'm not the first. Even A.W. Wilder Smith with his appearance at Oxford and all these, they just removed from uh, from re university yeah. records because yeah. of the deliberate anti-creation stand. And you can find uh, records about the BBC Hard Talk guests going back many, many, many years, but um, it mm. seemingly disappears any mention of John Mackay. So we are very, very grateful to the Lord that we've been able to, first of all, that we were given by the BBC. It's got the official BBC sticker on it and everything uh, for creation research. Um, and uh, it, it, we got that as a, one of the old uh, discs that we uh, used to have them on. And we were able to get that copied over into a digital copy, which which means that we've been able to put it up for you this evening and it will go up in about half an hour time so go and watch that there next week john you won't be with us no i shall be traveling yeah but we do have uh, the rest of the team we'll have diane and craig and probably glenn as well myself and sam and we're going to be dealing with the question of uh well a few weeks back we dealt with the question of indigenous people right uh, and distribution of people across the world this time next week we're going to be dealing with indigenous animals and plants and the distribution of animals and plants across the world from a biblical perspective and in fact a post noah's flood perspective as well uh, and who better to talk about that than a couple of australians seeing as they have these wonderful creatures that could have only evolved in the uh, country where they're from so uh, i'm of course speaking with sarcasm and we will talk about that more in detail a little bit later next week so we're looking forward to that do be sure to join us as we deal with indigenous animals uh, and animal and plant distribution until next time thank you very much for watching remember to like subscribe share the video around particularly the one that's going out in about half an hour which will be the full unedited interview and uh, and get it out there to people until next time goodbye and god bless and we will see you soon catch you later everyone goodbye. <laughs>